We've given the basic, uh, the following, the following definitions uh, so far. So if uh, f is a function from R n to R, its eventual conjugate is defined as the supremum of y transpose x minus f of x. And we saw an example that uh, if uh, if f is quadratic, then the gradient of f star is the inverse of the gradient of f. Now we're going to see this uh, more generally. But we need first um, a couple definitions that are important. Um, so if, if f is a function, again just writing the same thing I, uh, I wrote before, from rn to rn, then the epigraph of f is defined as all points x comma z such that z is greater than or equal to f of x. There's no reason that f has to be convex in order for this definition to make, uh, to make sense. So this means that, um, that, that, the, uh, that the epigraph is everything as everything above. And again, what I'm graphing here is uh, this is x and this is the z, uh, the z axis. So everything that lies above the function and, and any point here is the point f, uh, x comma, comma f of x. <clears throat> A, an, an exercise for you to check is that uh, the epigraph of f is convex if and only if the function it's, uh, f is convex. And note that if the epigraph of f is convex, what are uh, what are level sets? Level sets of the function are uh, are slices. So level uh, level sets, which we've worked with before, of our function f, are horizontal slices of the epigraph of f. And certainly, if the epigraph itself is convex, that implies that any slice in any direction through it is convex. So, in particular, all the level sets are convex. But the but the but the reverse implication is 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 not true. So, if the epigraph of f is convex, implies it implies all level sets are convex. But, as an example. Here is a non-convex epigraph, uh, and all of the level sets are, are indeed convex, but the function is um, but the function is not convex, and the epigraph of f is uh, is not convex. <clears throat> so what we want to work. Uh, uh, towards is thinking is our, our first step is understanding the uh, what the conjugate of the conjugate looks like and it and uh, the conjugate of any function whether that function is convex or not is convex and also has a property called closed so let's let's first talk about what uh, what closed means um, and uh, let me give a very brief review of an important concept from point set topology, um, which is the, a set being closed. So recall that uh, a set C, subset of Rn, is closed if it contains all its limit points. That means that 
if uh, if I have a sequence that's contained in C, so each xn is an element of C, if xn converges to x, then this implies that x is also in C. And uh, it's easy to check that uh, an arbitrary intersection of closed sets is closed. When I say arbitrary, I mean you can take infinite elements in the intersection. Um, a finite union of closed sets is closed. But an arbitrary union of closed sets may not be closed. You should also check that uh, any affine map of uh, a closed set is closed. Any affine map of a closed set is closed. And um, in fact, the inverse of any continuous map uh, maps closed sets to closed sets. We're, gonna, we're not going to really need that, but the affine map is just saying that if I do any, any kind of linear transformation that I'm going to map from a, from, a, from a closed set to a closed set. So now I can give a definition. A function is called, we already saw that a function is convex if and only if its epigraph is convex, and a function is called closed if and only if its epigraph, which is a set in Rn plus 1, is uh, a closed set. So a function f. Again, this is an independent notion from convexity. So a function can be closed, but not be convex. So it's, it's called closed if its epigraph is closed. So now a simple, a simple exercise, which we can think through uh, together, is, um, let me write it as a fact, is that if f is any function, it doesn't have to be convex, it doesn't have to be closed, then its ventral conjugate will always be closed and convex. So for f, any function, the function f star of y, I'll write out its definition, it'll be convenient for us to, to look at this, is closed and convex. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's show this. Convexity is, is immediate, and we've, we've used this property uh, many times, many times before. For closeness, again, we're going to have to, it, it, it's, almost, it's almost as immediate as well. Um, so why is it uh, convex? So convexity follows immediately from the definition of the fential conjugate. So just looking at what f star of y is, it's a supremum of y transpose x minus f of x. What does that mean? It's a supremum of linear functions. So for any particular, any fixed x, y transpose x minus f of x is just a linear term, y transpose x, it's linear in y, minus a constant. So this is just a bunch of affine functions, and f star of y is the supremum of affine functions. So it's certainly going to be convex. f star of y is the supremum of 
affine functions, which are convex. So hence, it's itself convex. And now uh, the question of why, why is it closed? So we just need uh, one, one simple step here, which is also pr pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, all we need to do is note that if I have two functions and I look at their max, so let's let g of x be defined as the pointwise max of two functions, g1 of x and g2 of x, then what is what does g what does g look like? And in particular, what is its epigraph look like? So uh, let's uh, so if this is g, and this is and it's a uh, this is its epigraph, and this is g two. and this is its epigraph then you can see what uh, what the what the relationship is with with the epigraphs so the epigraph of g is equal to the intersection of the epigraphs of g1 and g2 and now we can just put together the information that's already on this page and conclude that uh, that f star is closed, because f star is the um, is we said the supremum of linear functions. The epigraph of a linear function is exactly going to be a half space, so it's it's going to be closed. And uh, f star is equal to the supremum of affine functions. Therefore, the epigraph of f star is going to be the intersection of uh, of affine uh, of, of half spaces in particular the intersection of closed sets and therefore it's going to be closed so hence f star is closed so any function f i like take its conjugate it's it's closed and uh convex so now let's ask what happens if we take uh the conjugate of the conjugate. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's let's see what we um, what we have. F function from R n to R. Then F star of y is equal to the supremum of y transpose x minus f of x and f star star of x is equal to the supremum over y of x transpose y minus f star of y. So what I what I'd like to do is understand what the relationship is between f star star and f. So uh, thing that I'll leave for you to check is that the epigraph of f star star always contains the epigraph of f. And uh, I'll give you an, il an illustration of this. And note that I haven't written down the word convexity yet. Uh, but what do we know? We know that um, f star is convex. We just showed that, and we all and closed. And we also know that uh, f star star is is itself a conjugate, so it's also going to be convex. So its epigraph is going to be convex. So if they have this, uh, if we have this inclusion property, then what we should expect is that you know, if this is a uh, some non-convex function f, and this is its epigraph, then the epigraph 
of of f star will look something like this. Oops. So this is the epigraph. Not I said f star, I meant f star star. So in some way, f star star is the best approximation to a function that itself is uh, closed and, and convex. And so this is driving uh, towards the result that, um, that we want. And so we want to show um, if f is closed and convex, then the best, then if I look at its epigraph, that's closed and convex, and the best approximation by a closed and convex function is just itself. Translated into functions, this is saying that f star star equals f. Point-wise. So how are we going to show that uh, this is that this is uh, that this is the case? Again, we're going to work on or we're going to work with epi epigraphs. So uh, if so, what we're going to do is uh, we'll show just that we have equality of epigraphs. So in other words, that the epigraph of f star star is in fact equal to the epigraph of f. Again, one inclusion is, uh, is, is uh, I'll, I'll leave it for you, uh, i leave it for you to check. Um, the fact that the epigraph of f star star is bigger. But um, I want to show that it, it can't be strictly, uh, it can't be strictly bigger. So in other words, I, I want to show, I want to show the other inclusion. Um, so suppose we're going to proceed by contradiction. Um, so we will do this by contradiction. And how do we do that? Well, we're, we're talking about uh, convex sets. By assumption, f is convex, and therefore we know its epigraph is convex. And we've already talked about why this mean why the, the epigraph of any conjugate function, including of course a double conjugate, will also be convex. So we're talking about whether, and we know that uh, so so we want to talk about inclusion of uh, of convex sets. And I want to show that there can't be a point in the epigraph of f star star that doesn't belong to the epigraph of f. That will be showing the reverse inclusion that we need. And we have all the tools that the basic tools that we need, whenever you're thinking about showing inclusion for convex sets, you should be thinking about separation. Because if there's a point of f star star that's not in the, if, if there's a point in the epigraph of f star star that's not in the epigraph of f, then it must be that we can find, uh, we can find a linear separation that leaves the epigraph of f on one side and that point that we found from the epigraph of f star star on the, uh, on the other side. Okay, so this is um, this is exactly what what we're what we're going to do. So let's uh, let's let's show this. So let's let's suppose that there exists some uh, x hat with x hat comma uh, f star star of x hat. By definition, this is in the epigraph of f star star. Um, and so, so let's suppose that uh, this is not in the epigraph of f. So we've, we're, we're, let's assume we found a point that, that demonstrates that these are, are uh, not equal. I'm going to find a separating hyperplane. So again, the picture here is, I've got my convex function f. This is the epigraph of f, and I've found some point x hat here, and the height is f star star of x hat, so that these aren't, uh, so that it's not in the epigraph, and I'm going to find, and I'm going to use now 
the fact that there must be um, a, separating, uh, a separating hyperplane. Okay, so what is a separating, uh, what is a separating hyperplane going to look like? A separating hyperplane has an offset and it has a normal. The normal here, we need to remember that the epigraph is not a set in Rn, it's, an, it's a set in Rn plus 1 because it's x comma f of x. So my normal is going to have n plus 1 coordinates. Uh, so let me write out my, my separating hyperplane is, I'm going to write it as h of alpha, beta. So just remembering the form of a general uh, separating hyperplane, this is all uh, z, such that alpha transpose z is uh, equal to beta. And uh, alpha, in this case, is again going to be an element of r n plus 1. And so I'm going to write alpha as equal to... Um, You know, I really want to write alpha comma alpha zero. So let's, I don't know, let's put a tilde here. Um, alpha is going to be an Rn, and alpha zero is just uh, going to be my constant in, uh, in, or just going to be in R1. And beta, of course, is, uh, beta is in R. And, uh, and I can assume that beta is some value that's strictly less than zero. So I'm going to write the fact that this is a separating hyperplane uh, in the following way. Um, so assume that uh, H alpha beta separates x hat f star star of x hat from the epigraph of f. In other words, I can write, in other words, what this means is that alpha transpose x plus alpha 0 s minus alpha transpose x hat plus alpha 0 times f star star of x hat is less than or equal to some beta which is strictly less than 0 for any x s in the epigraph of f. And so I'm not writing x comma f of x. I, I, I could also I, I could also probably do that, but right, so I'm not I'm just I'm not writing x comma f of x, but just allowing any line on top of that because that's what that's what the epigraph of f uh, is. So this is uh this is by assumption now, if indeed there's a point x hat f star star of x hat that's not in the epigraph of f, then I can separate it, and this is uh, this is what uh, this looks like. So um, we're going to now reason about what um, what the what these coefficients of the separating hyperplane could be. So first of all, we can see right away that alpha zero, the way that I've chosen the signs, right? again I, I could have made this greater than beta, which is strictly greater than zero. So we, we could have done that. Um, oh, and, and note that another another result that I've used implicitly here is that we have strict separation. And whenever you have a point and a convex set, even if that convex set is infinite, I can have I have strict separation, which is which is what allows me to take this strict greater than or equal to sign. So if I have just generally two convex sets, which may both which might both not be compact, then in that case I can take strip I cannot take strict separation. So for example, if you think about the line x equals the, the, the horizontal line and the epigraph of, say, 1 over x, you'll see that even though these are two convex closed sets that uh, don't intersect, uh, you, can't, you can't strictly separate them with, uh, with, a, with a line. But, uh, but that's not true for, for a point or, or, in fact, any convex set and any compact set. You can always, uh, you can always do the separation. Um, okay, so wh what do we know about alpha 0? So, uh, you know, first thing to note immediately is that can alpha zero take any sign? And so, if uh, and and you see that the answer is no because just looking at um, there's a there's an S in here, and S allows me to map it, it, it is what can be 
any any value that's greater than or equal to f of x, then it's in the epigraph. Um, so if alpha 0 is positive, then this inequality can't hold because I can take s to positive infinity uh, because those rays are in the epigraph and there's there's no s over here, so this this quality would be would be violated. So we must have um, alpha 0 has to be non-positive. Um, just writing this note out. Okay, so alpha zero is is uh, is is less than or equal to zero, and we're going to show that actually uh, you can assume that alpha zero is strictly less than zero, but we're going to consider both cases. So, um, so let's uh, l l let's let's do that. So let's uh, let's show that um, that alpha zero is. Uh, is less than um, that. That we can take alpha zero to be uh, to be less than strictly less than uh, than zero. Um, So let's uh, first suppose that uh, alpha zero is is uh, equal to zero, and um, and let's see what uh, what happens. Um, and then we're going to show that if since we're going to show that we can reduce uh, this to the case where alpha zero is is strictly less than uh, strictly less than zero. <coughs> So let's uh, let's let uh, y hat be some element of the domain of f star. So some value where f star is not uh, plus infinity. So now I'm going to consider I'm going to show that we can take another hyperplane, another separating hyperplane which has alpha zero strictly uh, less than zero. So let me. You know, an important question is, um, what does this look like? What does a because the proof that we're going to show is just this, just a few simple algebra steps, but it's important to keep the geometry in mind. So, what does a, a separating hyperplane with alpha 0 equals 0 look like? In other words, what, what is it, what is the geometric operation of what we're doing? What would it mean to have to use a separating hyperplane with alpha equals, alpha 0 equals 0 look like? like what is that, what is that normal look like? I can kind of partially answer this question for you, but I want you to be able to think it, think it through. So what we're saying is this is x, which is an element of Rn, and up here we have another copy of R. Those are our n plus 1 dimensions. And this is our separating hyperplane, and this is our normal, which is alpha comma alpha 0. What does it mean for uh, the that last coordinate to be equal to zero? Okay, so I, I I'll, I'll I'll let you uh, just fin finish that off for yourself. To, but but it's important to make sure that you have the geometric uh, the geometric picture as well. Okay, so now l let's take a, let's take y hat um, in um, in the domain of f star. And I'm going to consider a new hyperplane. I'm going to consider H that has uh, alpha tilde plus some epsilon perturbation. I'm going to take epsilon small enough of y hat comma minus 1. And then with uh, with the same beta. Okay, so this is my new normal. This 
is my new normal vector. And, in, and indeed note that, that last, the last coordinate is going to be minus epsilon. So as long as I take epsilon positive, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have the, the property that I want. Because uh, again, you know, remember that alpha tilde here is equal to alpha comma zero because I'm assuming that alpha zero is, is equal to zero and showing that if, if that's the case, we can just take a modification of this, which is also separating hyperplane with alpha zero not equal to, uh, not equal to zero. So let's, let's write out, let me just show you the equation on the previous page. Let's, let's, uh, let's rewrite um, this now using, l l let's see what the implications of this are when I, when I use this new, uh, when I use this new equation. So I've got um, alpha transpose x plus alpha transpose zero, copying what I had before, but alpha zero is equal to zero, so this, this goes away. Um, minus alpha transpose x hat plus alpha zero, which is which is zero. But just writing it out so it's as, it's as close as possible to what to what you saw on the previous uh, page is um, less than uh, beta less than zero. So this is by assumption of what of what uh, of what the se original separating hyperplane looks like. And again, this is uh, this is zero. So let's see what the new separating hyperplane. Uh, let's say what the new what the new hyperplane does, and, and and verify that in fact it's separating, and it'll be so because of this uh, because of the strict inequality that we have here. So we've now have alpha plus epsilon y hat. You see, uh, again, I'm I'm looking at what the new what the new vector what the new vector is times x um, plus alpha 0 minus epsilon, but that's just equal to minus epsilon. So minus epsilon s minus not alpha hat anymore, but alpha, uh, sorry, not alpha transpose, but alpha plus epsilon y hat, alpha plus epsilon y hat times x hat minus epsilon, again, for all the same reasons, f star star of x hat. This is less than or equal to beta, but now I subtracted some extra stuff, extra stuff on the left-hand side, so I need to add it, I, I needed to add it on the right-hand side. So this is just, I'm just gonna add back whatever, whatever I took off on the left to make that uh, a consequence of what's, of what's above. So this is plus epsilon times y hat transpose x minus s minus y hat transpose x hat plus f star star of x hat. And so what you can see here is that as long as epsilon, and, and I want to know, does this hold for every possible um, x and s in the epigraph? Because that's what it means for this to be uh, a separating hyperplane. So in other words, I, I know that up, upstairs, this is true for every x, s in the epigraph of f. That's by, by assumption of having a separation. And is this true for every uh, epsilon f? Uh, epsilon, uh, sorry. Is this true for every x and s? And now let's just check where does, uh, where does x and s appear over here? It only, uh, it only, appears, uh, it only appears over here. So what happens if you take, if I try to make this, this inequality here, if, if I try to make this as big, as big as possible to check whether or not this is still less than zero, this is what I want to show. So the, my question here is this, is this still less than zero for every x s in the epigraph of f? Well, in order to check that, I need to find the worst case x s in the epigraph. What does that mean? I'm maximizing over all x s. So if I maximize this, maximize over x s in the epigraph of f, what do you get? You get that this is at most going to be beta plus epsilon 
times f star of y. You see that? Because what is the worst that this could be over here? Epsilon is positive. And so y transpose x minus s, I would, if I'm maximizing, I want to make s as small as possible. So therefore, it should equal to f of x. That's the smallest it can be in still being in the epigraph. And therefore, this is now a max over just x of y transpose x minus f of x, which is exactly the definition of f star of, uh, of y hat. Um, and then just completing, this is minus y transpose uh, x plus f star star of x hat. And it doesn't really matter what this, uh, what this is, because I can now take epsilon small enough and, uh, and, and, and therefore that completes, uh, that completes a story. So this is, again, still going to be strictly less than zero um, for epsilon small enough. So I, the, the, the problem with, with making this argument initially is that I need to check things for infinite, infinitely many x and s, but now we upper bounded it. So you see now, at this point, there's no x and s in there anymore. There's only an x hat and y hat, and I'm not looking at all, all x and y hat, x hat, y hat. Okay, so that means that we've, re we've reduced the setting to uh, alpha strictly less than zero. All right, so I think we can fit the rest of what we need to show in here. So the upshot so far is that uh, if there exists a separating hyperplane, or rather, uh, if there exists a point um, x hat f star star of x hat that's not in the epigraph of f, then there has to be a separating hyperplane with alpha 0 strictly negative. Then there exists a separating hyperplane with alpha 0 strictly less than 0. And now finally we can bring it home and show that this is going to give to give us give us a contradiction. So um, let's go back to our main inequality. So let's go back to uh, this inequality here and we're not going to cross out alpha 0 anymore because we know that this is a uh, because we know that this is alpha zero is strictly is strictly negative, and uh, just rewriting a little bit, I get um, alpha times <clears throat> I get uh, alpha x minus alpha x hat plus alpha zero times s minus alpha zero times f star star of x hat. I know that this is strictly less than zero for any possible x and s in the epigraph. Let me not get sloppy in the, uh, in the epigraph. And since alpha zero is non-zero, I can now just uh, divide through. So dividing through by not alpha zero, but negative alpha zero, so I don't have to flip the inequality signs. I find that I've got alpha divided by minus alpha zero times x plus f star star of x hat minus alpha divided by minus alpha zero of x hat minus s is less than or equal to beta divided by minus alpha zero, which is still going to be a strictly negative um, quantity. Okay, so now what is it that um, what is it that we uh, what is it that we want? Um, so uh, now I want to show um, that I have a uh, that that I have a contradiction, um, and I know that this again this inequality holds for every x and s 
in the epigraph of f. Okay. So if we take a supremum over uh, the epigraph of f, what is this? Uh, so what is this going to look like? Um, so since this is true for every x in s, taking a supremum over x and s in the epigraph of f, what I want to show is that this is that this this inequality can't hold. That will be finally. Um, my contradiction. And so if I take this uh, if I take this uh, if I take the supremum, I'm gonna find that I have F star of Y plus F star star of X hat minus y transpose x hat is less than beta over minus alpha 0, which is strictly less than 0. And now this is an exercise for you to see how did I get from the second to last step to the, to the, last, the second to last line to the last line. Um, what is y? So question one is what is y? And question two is why is this a contradiction? So think about those two uh, questions and we will continue on with uh, the final installment of, of properties of the Fenchel dual before we go on to um, looking at algorithms uh, in the dual.